CLE code before the panel discussion begins and the second code at the end of the discussion. And third, all of our attendees will be in a listen-only mode. So please use the chat feature if you have any questions, and we'll address those questions uh, during the presentation or at the end of the, uh, of the discussion, or we'll follow up at the end of them if we don't get to all the questions. Uh, and now I'd like to go ahead and introduce our panelists. Uh, we have Gordon Calhoun, who serves as the chair of the Electronic Discovery Information Management and Compliance Practice for Lewis Brisboy Bizgarden Smith. Frank Gilman, who is the Chief Information Officer for Lewis Brisboy Bizgarden Smith. Reggie Poole, a director in the Information Governance Group within the Law Department Consulting Practice at HBR Consulting. And Jeff Norris, the head of our Information Security for Managed Technology Services at LexisNexis Legal and Professional. Now, before we jump into our discussion, here's our first CLE code. Um, it's 99BGC, and you should see it on the screen. And now for today's panel discussion. What you see on the slide are the topics that we'll be covering today. This session is a third in a three-part series in which LexisNexis Managed Technology Services and Lewis Brisboy have been hosting throughout 2016. The first two were on interpreting and complying with audits and also information governance. Jeff, would you mind recapping just a couple of the highlights from those sessions? Sure, absolutely. Uh, thanks, Jesse. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is Jeff Norris. Um, in our first part of our series, we talked about interpreting audits and what has happened in the legal industry and what's been driving uh, audits within each of those firms. So some of the topics we covered were how are you interpreting audits, what things are driving uh, the increase and the, the demand of different things that you're, you're required to do within a law firm. Uh, what we recognize is that uh, the financial services industry drove a significant portion of that with third-party access and some of the things there. The topics we covered were more how do we react to those types of things with either service providers or firms in dealing with that. And as a service provider ourselves, and we had other service providers on the panel, how do we help law firms and clients work through in response to those audits? We also had a representative during that first session from AIG to talk a little bit about cybersecurity insurance and some of the resources that you can take advantage of with your insurers as well. In the second part of the series, we talked about information governance and security in the legal industry. And in that, we talked about some of the key factors for setting up a successful IG program. We talked about legal policy insurance risks as they relate to that type of program and how those practices were rolled out within firms that have started to do information governance and hiring things such as a data privacy officer or a chief knowledge officer from that perspective. So we looked at a lot of best practices in both of those areas. Jesse? Great. Thanks, Jeff. All right. Well, now for our first question. Uh, Gordon, if you could comment on the past, you know, how have law firms evolved in their response to data security and security audit, and how are you handling them now? Well, I think there's been, this is Gordon Calhoun, uh, there's been a real uh, uh, seismic change. I think for, for many years, lawyers uh, looked at their special status uh, and our ability to invoke the, uh, the attorney, client, and work product privileges as a, uh, uh, basically a shield for the confidentiality of uh, data that was entrusted to us. Uh, that really has undergone a massive change as the type of data that we deal with on a regular basis has undergone a similar uh, seismic change. It's gone from a paper world where you could literally uh, have everything in a physical file room in a law firm to a, um, a world where the volumes of data we're entrusted with or which we have to examine uh, basically fill the cloud. And uh, that's uh, really resulted in a, uh, a shock to the system for, uh, for many lawyers, uh, the idea that uh, we are in many respects just like any other hoster of data and need to comply with the, uh, the same kind of uh, uh, 
obligations as a financial institution or an insurance company is a uh, a real change, and it's being driven very rapidly by uh, the spread of those standards into other areas. Uh, you mentioned the uh, the financial sector was obviously a leading uh, uh, force there, but uh, we're seeing it in other uh, industries. The uh, national uh, the NAIC, National Association of Insurance Commissioners, has uh, gotten together and promulgated a uh, a model act uh, governing insurance companies and uh, much like laws governing those who deal with financial information or health information, uh, those are imposing obligations on insurance companies to maintain the confidentiality of data even after it leaves their, uh, their custody, much as uh, a healthcare provider has to maintain the confidentiality of uh, patient data when it leaves their custody going to another business associate or uh, somewhere else down the line. Uh, so we are now an integral part of the data management and data security process, and that uh, is a new and different uh, experience for, uh, for most of us. And uh, it, it's taking a bit of a challenge to get used to the notion uh, that we are not just lawyers anymore, but we're also managers of data, and we have uh, responsibilities for security and privacy protection with respect to that information over and above our uh, uh, professional obligations and the intellectual process we bring to that information. So uh, we are now very much involved in dealing with uh, the process of, of audits, and we also are transmitters of data downstream. So one of the real uh, challenges for us and for anybody else who transmits data is monitoring those with whom we work, making sure that the consultants we retain on behalf of our clients are secure in their handling of the data and keeping the, uh, the documentation necessary to, uh, to demonstrate that we've taken the necessary steps to, uh, to protect that data. All of that's new, and in, in many respects, we're becoming just like any other business that deals with data. Excellent. Thanks. Uh, Frank or Reggie or Jeff, would you like to add to that? Sure. You know, I, I think the other, it's Frank, um, the other thing kind of to Gordon's point, uh, which I think is fascinating to watch from an evolutionary standpoint is, it used to be not that long ago that everything about data security and everything else was a very it was important, but it was also isolated, you know, at law firms and other companies to you know the IT people, to the the mad scientists, to to all the you know to the tech aspects of the business. And I think what's happened now with data security audits is they've really They've grown much more in importance in terms of the overall business structure. There's much more um, involvement in the top line executives in these things because so much of it has to do now with client relations and the ability to maintain and secure uh, those clients moving forward as well as to attract new ones. And so I, I think what's what's interesting in my mind is that the the whole notion of data security has evolved you know, really more organizationally than uh, and broadly than it used to kind of be um, where, where it was, like I said, was always kind of sequestered a little bit with a group of people in the firm as opposed to really becoming more of a broader company initiative. So this is, this is Reggie. Um, I'll add to that because I, I guess you uh, kind of enter this conversation with a different view um, I work with a lot of clients, external counsel, um, you know, in-house corporate counsel, et cetera, and have had the privilege or, if you want to call it that, of actually working with law firms and responding to, you know, applying and responding to some of these data security audits and surveys, et cetera, and some of the changes that we've seen from the past, you know, which I think you said it very well. It used to be a very isolated group that concerned, that concerned about this. And one of the things that I, when I have my conversations with some of the clients, um, you know, even as early as, you know, two years ago, when I'd ask about the data privacy or data security, um, at, you know, process within the firm, I would get, oh, well, we're ISO compliant or we're, you know, we're looking at 
making sure that we follow those standards. And what we've seen over the last few years is that it's, ISO is just not enough. I mean, it's the while the standards exist that you, you would try to achieve or to be compliant with, you have to look beyond that now. Um, the surveys and the requests that we put forward to firms to have them fill out some of the requirements that we have around there extend well beyond just technical aspects of, you know, are you meeting the ISO requirements? It, it goes more into how are you managing the content? What are you looking at in terms of how are your, how are your people being trained? Um, how are you managing third-party vendors? What are you doing, with, like you had mentioned, the downstream activities of making sure all the, those types of um, agreements and checks and balances are in place? So I think the change is pretty apparent. Yeah, this is Jeff. I would echo uh, those, those same comments. And what we've seen uh, as a service provider as well is we, we see that, that trickle down of the, the request. And as, as everyone here has kind of uh, described, in the past it used to be, do you have these things, or it was a smaller audience that was kind of having these internal discussions. It's much more prevalent now. And what we're finding is, is that those questions, those audits, the, 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 the interrogation, so to speak, of data security comes in at the prospecting side of business, answering some of these questions up front rather than taking some of these as part of the sales presentation or acquiring a client and then then doing an audit after the fact. So it's, it's very much becoming more of an upfront process um, and more so the attestations of, of the ISO and then the validation afterwards. So going through that and making sure that um, the, the firms are saying what they do, but then there's also a little bit of validation of are they doing what they say, and that's the typical audit um, that we see through that. So I would, I would definitely echo all of those comments, and, and what we see is the increased, uh, the, the number of questions that we have, but they're more pointed now. They're, they're very much so of data security has reached a, there's a bar that everyone that meets to a, to a certain extent, and that's driven by a lot of the past audits that have come out, um, or a more complete understanding of what the controls need to be, and now it's a further refinement. Are you meeting some of these, or how exactly are you doing uh, this particular control, or some things that uh, they look for in, in terms of all of the, the security aspects and, and controls? That's great. Thanks for that. Well, great. So as organizations put more formal policies in place to deal with data security, uh, Frank, would you start off our discussion to talk about how your firm handles education and change management to accommodate these new strategies? Sure. I mean, I, mean, I think that, I think just like anything else, change no matter, regardless of the topic, you know, in order to have true change management, it has to be um, top line driven, that there has to be a commitment from senior leadership across the board uh, for anything to take place. I think that the, the difficulty and the challenge with uh, information security is everything that, that goes into being an effective lawyer uh, and an effective firm in terms of customer service and responsiveness and, and being able to be quick and nimble uh, and competitive, you know, the more uh, foundational security companies put in, the more we lock down and, and put restrictions and protocols in. Those two things uh, definitely diverge. And, and it really creates a, a push-pull effect about how can we be, how can we meet our security guidelines, how can we control the flow of information and secure it while still being responsive uh, to our the needs of our clients, uh, you know, on an ongoing basis, and so I think part of it comes into, you know, really identifying the why. I, I call it identifying the why, which means organizations, as we're bringing out mandates, there's just this feeling. I, I think that that employees and personnel get about the the whole idea of Big Brother. That is, oh wait a minute, you know, if you're locking things down and if you're policing everything that you can see everything we're doing and and sometimes that that can be used um, potentially um, you know indirectly for bad things and so I, I think a lot of it comes down to communication and really identifying why 
uh, and how doing these types of things and, and falling into more um, formal policies actually helps us grow the business, helps us drive, helps us continue to drive revenue. And I, and I think that is a much different message and a more effective one uh, to kind of promote information security. And that's kind of what we try to do. We, we really try to focus it more on, you know, what's in it, what's in it on a positive side, you know, for the future and not just, hey, let's talk about how we can, uh, you know, by doing all these things, uh, you know, potentially make our lives more challenging in terms of being responsible. And I, and I think that's kind of the most critical piece. Yeah, great. This Thanks. is Jeff. Um, I, I would agree, and I think um, what Frank touched on with making sure that the policies are communicated, that, that tends to be the basis, is uh, we've seen in terms of educating our own organization as we start out with those policies and helping communicate those things and how they can be effective at helping um, deliver the services and be kind of a, a, a benefit to how your your selling the work and, and saying, here's how we support all of the processes that we have in, in place, right? And <clears throat> like you have here on the slide, changes don't happen overnight. And it's a, it's a matter of um, choosing the things that have the highest risk and highest reward, going through and making sure people are aware of some of these things as you continue to roll them out throughout the organization. So having different ways to communicate, whether that's email, whether that's doing it with uh, webinars internally, having meetings or brown bag sessions for lunches, those types of things. It's just being able to communicate those messages and here's the things that you're doing from a security perspective and here's what we want the organization to do and here's the behavior that we'd like modeled as we go through that. So it's really key for how you go through that whole process, um, making sure that everybody are aware of it. <clears throat> As we all know, it's it's really hard when you see the the data security folks that'll that'll come out with, okay, we've got to go through the training here, and we've got to do that. There's a lot to take in, so how you deliver that is is critical because it's it's just another thing for everybody to to understand, realize, and and in a lot of cases comply with. I think one of the things that's helped too is, you know, data security in general is, is a topic that's entered the culture, you know, far beyond business. It's in, you know, not a day goes by, not a week goes by where there's not a story of, of one element of cyber, cyber crime, cyber security, data breaches, you know, in the, in the mainstream news media across the uh, social media, you know, I, I think people dealing with all sorts of um, identity theft in their personal lives. So, so there's much more, you know, like we were talking about, the, the, the data security has become a broader topic or, or data audits have become a broader topic organizationally. I think the whole notion of data security, uh, people are just much more aware of it uh, just in general. So, so they're not as you know, opposed to it in organizationally, I think it's more, you know, as we we're saying, about really fine-tuning and crafting the communication and, and making sure people understand how data security is being applied to our particular organization, uh, you know, because there's just so many different flavors and, and, and finding that balance, uh, you know, to, that fits the, the organization's culture. And this is Gordon going with the uh, issues that you're talking about, Frank. Uh, in addition to the, the training, there's also a, uh, a hardware infrastructure uh, change that's, that's occurring. Uh, lawyers in particular want to have access to data in as many different places as possible so as to be as responsive as possible to clients, which creates a, a real challenge, uh, particularly when uh, lawyers were personally transmitting uh, media on devices like thumb drives or disks or uh, uh, some other uh, media, uh, getting them out of that kind of thinking and into a, uh, a thin screen environment where they access uh, their data from devices like a, 
a smartphone or, an, or a, uh, a tablet or a portable machine which doesn't itself contain the data uh, once it's turned off. Um, these are uh, kind of attitudinal changes. You, you can actually do more with the, uh, with the thin screen technology than you could by lugging around a bunch of thumb drives and not knowing which one you needed to plug into your, uh, your machine. But the data security uh, gets increased exponentially when we get away from uh, those devices that can be easily dropped out of a pocket or uh, uh, left on a ledge or uh, otherwise uh, potentially compromisable. So there's a technology component uh, as well as an educational component going with the, uh, the delivery of the message on how to uh, uh, best secure your data for your uh, organization. Yeah, Gordon, absolutely. This is Jeff, and I know um, to kind of uh, go with that, the implementation of those technologies and helping explain the benefits of both how you can increase the security, but also increase the access and doing it the right way, right? It's, it's rare when you have uh, security implementations that are meant to protect things or maybe keep people from getting to certain things where they start to really enable and drive change within the organization and do it safely and securely, right? So implementing security controls or uh, technology in the organization, if done correctly with the right communication, you let your constituents pick the most secure method to do that and help drive them into that process and it benefits everyone if you're able to do that. And, and I think right. that's really, really where it, it's going. Uh, you've got to have the message delivered in a positive way. Uh, you're not get, just getting more security, but you're getting more availability in terms of, of the things you need to do jobs properly for your clients. And I think that's the real, the real way to make uh, change possible because lawyers in particular are conservative animals who like precedent and like doing things the way they've always been done. Uh, but getting the notion across that there's a better, uh, more effective, lower cost way of doing it uh, is actually attractive, uh, particularly to our clients. And uh, much of this is actually being driven by, uh, by client demand as opposed to uh, internal uh, uh, in incentives from, uh, from the legal profession. So this is Reggie. One of the things that we see, let me actually kind of put a bow on it all in, in the tie it all together is that, you know, by providing the right technologies um, and giving options rather than being totally prescriptive, letting people know that there are different ways they can manage some of their content in an effective and secure process. But then also, as has been mentioned over and over again, having them understand the why we're doing something, um, why we're asking you to change the way you're managing content, the way you're using your technology, et cetera. What we found, and we do a lot of change management within our practice, is that, and it's always interesting because you go in and think, I'm about to introduce change, how are people going to react? What we find is that even through the training process, the communication process, there seems to be this huge corporate collective sigh. And rather than anger, a lot of the people, you know, the employees will, will sit there and say, thank you. I mean, it's, it's, it's kind of amazing when you go through the process because if you give them the process, tell them what you need to do, why it's important to do it, and give them the path to go down that way with the right training, and they'll say, thank you, because, you know, I've only been doing what I've been doing because no one ever told me the right way to do it. And so, you know, introducing that change, that training, that process, you're going to get a lot more compliance um, by giving them the options, giving them the training, and having them understand exactly where and why you're doing what you're doing. Well, that's great. And, you know, with all this education also, we have to try to make sure that, you know, this message is competing with um, everybody's precious time for all the other messages and work that's out there as well. Well, thanks, guys. Uh, so for the next one, Reggie, would you uh, be so kind to of start off the discussion about, you know, once you've established the strategy and the policy to deal with data security, you know, you, you can't just set it and forget it. So. What are the top considerations from your point of view on, on how you would handle the ongoing continuous change? Right, and, and a lot of it is getting in front of the process, um, making sure you understand what's happening within the organization, what's changing. And some of these changes that occur, especially within firms, are driven by the requirements of the clients. And um, I think some of the challenges that you'll find is that 
you may have agreed to a process or utilizing technology, a third party technology, internally by an attorney that's outside of your control or your understanding. So, you know, trying to understand what kind of agreements you're going to put into place, what some of your requirements are, um, your liabilities, your responsibilities. But there's also the ongoing monitoring activity. And that goes both from a people uh, and process and technology, whether it's understanding what the um, uh, process and it is for uh, access controls, uh, making sure that you're monitoring any kind of a logging activities when, when possible to see if uh, there are activities going on like in terms of accessing external sites, etc. But putting some type of process in place, some type of a reporting process in place that kind of introduce, that allows you to see any changes uh, as they're occurring. You know, Reggie, when you're talking about process, you know, it reminds me, to me, when, when we talk about this whole type of topic, you know, I, I think it kind of almost goes hand in hand with developing, you know, a, a true, what some people in the industry call a vulnerability management program. And, and, and specifically, you know, coming up with a process, like, it, it's about more than process. It's, your process has to be, defined as something that's measurable and that's repeatable so that as you implement the process, as an organization implements the process, there, there's a way to truly execute upon it and execute it with an emphasis on, you know, improvement. And, and I think that's, you know, when we're talking about setting it and forgetting it and everything else, you know, th there's the, there's the question that, that a lot of, uh, when I go to different CIO events, that we always get into about when do you know you're done? <laughs> you know, how, when is, when is the, when is the environment truly secure? Uh, you know, and the answer is, is most likely never. Uh, so, so the question is, how do we kind of find a spot where we, where we feel comfortable enough uh, to, to hit the risk management levels that we're looking to do, to feel confident enough that we're responding effectively, uh, you know, and meet that thing. And, and, and I think that's one of the things about when people say, you know, don't set it and forget it. It's to get in the mindset of seeking continuous improvement, that each time we work on our security protocols and our information governance approach, each time we do it, we we have a way to measurably say we're better than the last time we did it. Not that we're perfect, but that we're achieving improved results with each and every pass. And so that's why I get back to, you know, one of the things we, we really struggle and we really look at. And Gordon, you know, having a working alongside a resource like Gordon makes it a lot easier for me. Uh, but, you know, having and, and continuing to, to build a process that's genuinely measurable, you know, and that we can consistently return to so that we're looking at those benchmarks. Uh, and that's following really up point. on that, Frank, um, what, we, what we also have to take into account is not just the continual evolution of the systems that we put in place, but the change that's brought on by uh, new and often more rigorous client requirements. And this becomes uh, a real management issue uh, for a law firm because partners are out there meeting with clients all the time, signing up new engagements. Um, the client requirements need to be aggregated in a central place so that we as an organization can know that we're meeting uh, the requirements that our clients have set. So there's, there's change, uh, continuous process, not just in terms of the evolution of the people a process and technology that we've already brought on board, but we're continually getting an infusion of new process demands uh, from clients. And if, if we don't keep our eye on that ball also, we run the risk of uh, running afoul of an audit or uh, uh, that shocking experience of a client coming in and saying you're non-compliant and if you can't get compliant in 30 days, uh, the files will be moving or simply taking the files because you're not compliant with uh, with the standards. You could be uh, you could meet an industry requirement, 
but perhaps not a particular client's requirement. And knowing what those are is, and, and managing those different standards is an important part of the process as well. So, yeah, well, one of the things we look for, again, when we're putting together some of the surveys and, and the audits and what we're seeing a growing, you know, response to is what kind of processes do you currently have in place? I mean, how often are you meeting with your IG board, your IG group, your committee, and, and reviewing existing processes? Um, what type of uh, systems do you have in place right you know, to monitor your, your current systems when things are being retired, when new systems are being brought on? And what are the processes to ensure that they're being reviewed for both the security aspect as well as the types of content from privacy? And so we're really looking for those, those repeatable processes that show that there's an ongoing activity to keep things up to date. Yeah, Reggie, I, I would echo that as well. And I think what we're really getting at is when in that change management process or, or even as a periodic review, how are you able to take a look at both what um, uh, Frank and Gordon talked about with external factors, your, your clients maybe pushing requirements, or you see new regulatory items that are out there reviewing existing processes or new technology is coming into play or even hardware and software refreshes may drive some of these change. But at the end of the day, it's really a risk assessment in terms of are we still meeting some of the security requirements that are in there? Have we gone outside of our own threshold for what that happens to be from a compliance perspective, a legal perspective, an operational perspective, all of those types of things. So setting up some kind of program uh, or process as these things are coming in where you've got folks that can actually take a look at it from a risk perspective and say, yep, that still meets the spirit of what we're doing. Here's some of the, the changes we may need to make. Let's take a look at this. How does that impact our information governance perspective? Do we need a new retention requirement for some of these or a way to handle this new type of matter uh, that's coming in? So having just a, a, a piece of a review as you're acquiring these new things and just taking you know, even if it's 10 minutes to say, let's think about this as we're, we're trying to set this up, is important as you go through. No matter how big or small the organization is, is being able to make sure that this is always a, a point that's covered when you're talking about new business, refreshes, hardware, processes, anything that's, that's done throughout there. Reggie, do you find your clients, you know, are they actually taking the step you know, to define true vulnerability management programs, or, or is it still kind of more of a, you know, awareness of it, but they kind of haven't taken that step, you know, toward really formalizing something like that, you know, in addition to their other information governance uh, programs? So I think, you know, we're not saying it's still kind of its infancy, and a lot of it hasn't been directly, isn't being directly addressed with vulnerability. Can't say the word. Vulnerability management program. Um, you know, the primary activities we're seeing are more aligned the lines of what you're talking about from an IG perspective of making sure that the program is in place, that the technology supports where they're at, and, and hardening what they have um, as best as possible. No, I don't, I mean, it, I think it's a trend that we're definitely seeing more activity around, but it is definitely not something that is kind of frontline in terms of when we're talking about the clients today. Yeah, this is Jeff, and I think what we've seen across the, a number of our clients is the vulnerability management program uh, ranges from just starting with how to identify those, um, or may have a process to find vulnerabilities that a lot of folks scan. The harder part is more the remediation process, because as you go through remediating or attempting to patch, those tend to sometimes cause problems within the infrastructure itself, whether it's the application doesn't work well with that or it's just not even, uh, uh, it doesn't even work with the application. It causes problems and you have to back those things out. So um, the vulnerability management program, the clients that we've seen have been in that just initially starting and somewhat starting to mature and, and how, they're, how they're able to address any, anything that comes out of that. 
hopefully is a part of implementing those types of programs. And, and Frank, this is what I, I think we're, we're trying to say here is, as you're doing that, you start to discover how those processes work and how they help you identify these different areas of changes for access controls or changes for uh, any, any of the different control uh, paradigms that you're looking at and how do you address those as a continuous improvement process, right? So it's how do you identify it, you're scanning, you're finding these new things, how are you staying up with these changes and are those important to you? Right. And, and one thing we, we really haven't talked about yet, you know, we, we've been talking about soft, you know, like, like as, al as always in these types of topics when we're talking about information security, you know, we focus on the hardware, we focus on the software, we focus on the client uh, and the external threats, but, but I think one of the biggest challenges, again, you know, that every time there's a, there's a piece of malware or, or other threats out there, it's given a name, um, you know, and and there's a lot of coverage about it, but but I think the biggest, you know, to information security remain, you know, common names of men and women, Jim, Alice, Sally, Dave, you know, those are the people that, you know, human behavior, uh, you know, is still the largest by far uh, threat to to information security. Uh, you know, because I can, I can engineer, I can spend a lot of time or I can, you know, find someone to engineer, you know, a malicious piece of code and hope that it will get propagated, but it's much easier to easily manipulate uh, well-meaning human individuals uh, to do uh, all sorts of things that open up um, information security holes uh, instantly. Absolutely. One of the things that we always find is it's, you know, you can put the, the most technology in place as you can to try to protect yourself, but you can't stop that. You know, can't stop someone from, when they're not in the office, accessing content, going to, you know, we're like working, even working with outside um, organizations and clients, right? I mean, sometimes the biggest problem is that the clients themselves may be providing uh, portals that you're needing to access and your content goes other places where you don't have that control and you know there's really not a lot you can do from your side other than education to try to make people aware of some of the risks or concerns around putting client content on other locations where it can't be monitored and um, protected effectively um, and so I mean and, and again like you're saying a lot of it comes down to the education and making sure that people understand the risks and their behavioral change yeah, this is Jeff. I completely agree with that. I mean, what we find is, is that in security programs uh, where I've come from in the past as well as, as where we are today, that's kind of your, your soft spot is the, is the, the well-meaning employee, right? Everybody has in their nature to help resources, right? And that's what phishing depends on. That's what social engineering depends on. That's what some of these things depend on is the well-meaning nature of human beings, period. So we all want to be in a position to help, and we all, as either firms, service providers, or consultants, we're there to help. So it's really kind of at odds when we talk about security programs and we talk about training is to try and help individuals recognize you're going to be taken advantage of. So how do you spot and recognize those type of things so that you can be helpful but be cautious at the same time? Well, I think part of this, Gordon, I think part of the uh, uh, change that's going on is the data that we're talking about is being referred to as the new oil. Information is <laughs> tremendously valuable, and it's access to that information by the wrong people that uh, creates the security issues we're talking about. So what, one of the fundamental things that we have to get across is that that information has to be treated with respect. And it, it, this is perhaps the way to get uh, beyond that uh, impulse to help. Uh, if people start recognizing, and they are, that the data is truly valuable and you don't just share it with anyone or you at least make sure that the person you're sharing it with is who they purport to be, um, that goes a long way, a very simple concept goes a long way to instilling 
in the human, the weakest component of data security, an understanding of why uh, following protocols and procedures is, is critical. And really getting it down to that simple uh, level of understanding it is difficult, and, and many of the approaches we take don't recognize that uh, fundamental simplicity in in how data security is it needs to work uh, with our uh, with our employees, with our our knowledge people, uh, our our possessors of knowledge, and uh, until those kind of changes in approach to how we treat data uh, occur, it, data security is going to continue to be a real uh, a real problem, and the human component is going to be, as Frank points out, uh, the biggest the biggest weakness in any uh, any security system. Well, so you know, to, to kind of pile on with that, one of the challenges that we see on a regular basis is what we're calling the, consum the consumerization of IT, right? And it's that the consumer, the you know, the employee looks to, wants to have the same tools available to them in the workplace that they're used to working with outside and being able to quickly respond and transmit and chat and save and access anywhere they go and you know without I think the challenge within the firm is going to be to try to provide the right systems that can still meet that requirement but at the same time provide the right level of security and privacy protection um, and understanding what those you know what those requirements are for the consumer side but also the challenges within the firm in terms of how to roll out the right types of solutions. And I think we talked about it earlier, and sometimes it's not being prescriptive, but about, about providing the right tools that can meet those needs while still allowing the right level of protection. Great discussion. Well, good. Well, then, uh, Jeff, if I could ask you uh, to start off the next discussion, um, would you talk about the implication of some of the new infrastructure technologies that are on the horizon? Sure. And um, it, it kind of dovetails right into this topic as, as we kind of look forward and, and we're trying to, to come to grips with how do we deal with continuous monitoring um, and how do we stay on top of our, our risks, how do we stay on top of our data security programs, and with all of the, the demands from our clients, the, the changes that both our, our infrastructure, our people, and our processes drive, we've got, a, we've got a lot of new things that are ahead, even on just the technology side. So getting those programs in place to at least identify when changes are, are happening, how to deal with some of those things will help you as kind of the, the world starts to move forward and we look into more of the cloud technologies, what what things that those uh, those technologies have and the impact they have on a security program or security posture. Um, the newer things that are coming out are, and a lot of people may have heard of hyper-converged infrastructure where you're moving to combine storage, you're combining networking, you're combining compute, all in the same chassis, and you're now having the advent of the, the DevOps terms, where now you're putting a lot more power and, and resource at the fingertips of the, the folks that have been doing more infrastructure and uh, development within your organization, now they can use some of these newer tools where they're all kind of co-mingled and they can readily start to spin up uh, servers uh, and, and environments for you to host an application and then start putting data in there. So the, the speed of what those technologies are coming out and the capabilities uh, that they have now really accelerate people that have large infrastructures and needs to do something like this and respond very quickly, but at the same time it changes the entire security, pro the, the paradigm that we have. Um, we've talked in the past about security um, as being contained within the four walls that you have. And now when we talk about cloud computing, the advent of public cloud and being able to take advantage of SaaS-based services, you're almost perimeterless within your organization. So you find that um, from a security perspective, you have to deal with things that are now outside of your control. Um, 
and what we see now is software defined networking and a, a lot of these technologies that are out there they're starting to implement some other things that really allow security to take advantage of it but it's a whole new mindset and it's a whole new uh, technology uh, environment and tooling that you have to get your resources to come to grips with so we're really starting to see a lot of these things converge um, and being able to deliver services faster but it really takes a mind mind shift to take a look at how do you now take what was legacy controls that we've been asked to do X Y and Z how do we now achieve those in a technology stack that is collapsed and the, the good thing about it is, is that it's getting closer to where security stays with the data. As kind of Gordon says, we've got this data that is the new oil that's out there. And security controls in a, in a perfect environment would stay with the data as it goes through its entire life cycle. Some of these technologies that are coming out are allowing you to get closer to that where security stays with the actual data itself. But it's a whole new mindset. It's a whole new way of thinking, and it's a it's a whole new um, tooling that you have to provide to your your entire IT staff, not just the security folks, and how they work together. So that that's what we're seeing is we we see from a from a service provider, and we do provide cloud computing and a lot of these. This is this is kind of what we see in the in the future, and we're starting to to use some of these technologies to deliver services. And we have to start thinking in those new models uh, as we go down there. Frank, I know you're starting to look at some of these, uh, the IT um, components that you have there. Uh, can you share some, some thoughts that you have in this space? Sure. And, and you are correct. It is a, it is a very different model. Uh, but I would actually argue that, that it, it's an exciting and an easier model because what it really does uh, to me is, is you know and I have this conversation all the time with my staff about uh, you know what our mission is you know and what our mission as, as a firm is our, our mission as a firm is to deliver professional services it's not to be data managers you know and our mission as an IT staff is to really support the lawyers and, and personnel of the firm it's not it's not really the technology business and so what I what I like about hyperconvergence, and, and we've actually been, uh, we're in the midst of, of converting a large chunk of our uh, infrastructure to a, a hyperconverged back end, is because of this. It's because it actually does, by, by consolidating it uh, and keeping the security more, uh, for the lack of a better word, nimble, uh, I, I think you actually do gain better control. I think you get much better um, visibility. Uh, from its entire, uh, from the entire life of the entire life cycle of the data, uh, and I, I think it really starts to make that that task simpler, you know, simpler and more controllable. And, and I think, and, and like we talked earlier, the fact that you can combine that and use that as a business lever to say, okay, by going in this structure, we're starting to take better control of our um, security from top to bottom while at the same time being able to make it easier for our lawyers and more effective strategically for our lawyers to practice and, and I think that is just you know that is not a hard thing to sell you know it's not a hard thing to sell uh, internally to stakeholders it's not a hard thing concept to sell to leadership, it's not a hard thing to sell publicly, uh, you know. And and I just think it's a, it's a really exciting opportunity to kind of reshape uh, this particular discussion. So you know, from an information governance standpoint, I mean, the new technologies, the hyperconvergence, the uh, ability to bring you know things on rapidly, etc. What it does, though. So what we're seeing with our clients is it changes the face of the IG program and some of the requirements and how it needs to be able to react. Um, we're seeing, you know, now that the IG groups, the players have to be more nimble and to be able to be a part of, uh, you know, and setting up the right requirements 
and working with IT so that they understand some of the requirements around what how, how content needs to be managed. You kind of borrowing from you know, some of the privacy work is it's kind of like making sure that there's security and privacy by design in the uh, in the process when you're spinning up these new environments. And not only that, it's it's putting the right processes in place. You know, making sure that the IG team because things are moving so much quicker, um, they're really more part of the SDLC process to understand when content's being or new systems are being brought on and what are the effects those systems going to have, what kind of content is going to be managed there. We're seeing a, a, a great increase in you know, processes like data classification and assigning specific classification to content at the beginning of the process so you can monitor it throughout the whole activity. Um, more and more we're seeing, like I think you'd mentioned a little bit more, the security main, staying with the data. You know, rights management is becoming a, a much bigger play right now with a lot of our clients. And, and how that plays out across, you know, working with um, both your service provider and vendors as well as um, your clients and having the right technology in place to support, you know, that level of, of control over that content. But again, what it really comes down to is that the IG group, the records team, the security and privacy groups that they all work together have to be a lot more nimble and, and to be able to address some of the, the faster changes within the IT environment. Yeah, completely agree. I think, um, Frank, I, I love your analogy of, of you know thinking that it's also exciting at the same time because now you get to see the benefit of some of these things that are out there. So, <clears throat> getting your staff up to speed on some of these things and being able to deliver them up front, um, kind of as Reggie's going through, as we're thinking about how do we build in security into the design as it go goes forward. Um, there's a lot of exciting things you can do where you can give that flexibility to the, the DevOps team and, and the IT folks that some of those security components come along for the ride, right? If they're, if they're designed appropriately up front when you're laying this groundwork for these new technologies, some of these things are inherently built in and you can really take advantage of it. And that's, that's the exciting part from a, a security practitioner as well is you're not always having to go back after the fact and possibly bolt things on or do things differently as you go through it. So it is quite exciting. Um, at, the, at the same time, there's some things that you also continuously have to monitor these types of things as well because at the same time, they're very easy and flexible and, and fast to do some of these things. Um, there's probably a high chance of success that you could probably unwind them just as fast. <laughs> so it's some of those things. You still have to have some of those fundamentals to uh, detect that those controls are still in place and be able to test those. That's where your vulnerability management program needs to, to move forward to address some of these things too. How do you scan for that? How do you make sure that those things are staying in place? So yeah, absolutely agree. So these these new technologies are driving change that's in there and it's all exciting to be able to deliver on the premise of, of everything that we've talked about. But it, at the same time, you still need to take into, into account all those other things need to come with it. The, the change management, the, the education of all of those components, the vulnerability management program, uh, and all of those items. In terms of, of the law firm, uh, one of the things that uh, we have to take into account is that lawyers, particularly those in litigation, are dealing with uh, with yesterday's news, with data and information as it existed two, three, five, even ten or more years ago, um, and, and that creates kind of an impediment to adopting some of the very uh, innovative and uh, solution-oriented matters that you've just discussed. Lawyers are still living in a Microsoft world. We're still living basically in an SQL database world where our clients, where uh, retail are using uh, a Hadoop environment, using uh, uh, true big data uh, to make their, uh, their decisions. They've gone a couple of generations ahead of where lawyers typically are in terms of the type of information they use in their daily lives. And we who service those industries need to be aware not just of what our little corner of the world looks like, but what the world that our clients deal with looks like and make sure that our uh, security infrastructures are uh, adept enough to deal with the information types that the clients deal with. And that's, uh, that's a new disconnect that's just uh, 
coming onto the horizon. But I, I think you've pointed to uh, a number of the solutions to that problem, and, and the trick is managing change in the law firm so that we understand that our clients are a generation or two ahead in terms of uh, the types of information with, with which they deal on a, da a daily basis. Well, great discussion, everybody. Thanks so much. Uh, if we could take a just a pause for a moment right now. I don't see any questions uh, right now, but does anybody on the call have any questions? If you do, uh, if you could just use the chat or the questions tool on the right-hand side, that would be great. And I don't see any coming up in the uh, queue right now. Okay, well, great. Well, awesome discussion, guys. Thanks so much for our panelists, for Gordon, Frank, Reggie, and Jeff. Uh, and as we close out today's uh, seminar, if I can just uh, add a few closing comments. First of all, uh, please keep in mind all attendees will receive an email within a week with a link to the recording of today's webinar. Uh, and if you are seeking CLE credits, you'll also receive a separate email from the LexisNexis University team providing further instructions on how to secure your credit. Uh, and I'm going to give you that second code right now, but there were a couple people I may have, uh, that I heard from that may have said that they needed the first code again. So again, that first code is 99BGC, like Bravo Golf Charlie. And the second CLE code, which is on the screen right now, is D as in Delta, 94, Q as in Quebec, nine. So thanks again, Gordon, Frank, Reggie, and Jeff for today's informative discussion. And thanks to all of our attendees for taking time out of your busy day to join us. Have a great day.